Hey y'all, William did a Pungo Prairie. Now back when I started this channel, I told you I was gonna share a few of my recipes, tell a few hunting stories, and some fish tales too. So, in keeping with that promise, this is one of my most all-time favorite fishing adventures. Plus, a really great story about my dear pioneer friend Ben and how he built the most amazing little camp in the middle of the Canadian wilderness. Let's climb up in the Pungo Prairie Wayback Machine and take a little trip back in time way up to northern Quebec along with my good buddy Ben and Dr. Stan Porter. So buckle up and don't go nowhere because you don't want to miss this. It's a beautiful, serene Friday afternoon in late May. There's just a feather-light breeze out of the south, and the clouds are beginning to move in from the west. It appears that we may be in for an evening spring shower. I'm sitting in this canoe on a lake in the middle of the eastern Canadian wilderness. I'm casting a line, jigging back a red and white crocodile spoon, catching lake trout. Not one right after another, but enough to keep it interesting. The only other two humans, probably within a hundred mile radius, are Dr. Stan and Ben, who are back at the cabin grabbing a siesta. Now you may be wondering, how do you get a canoe, not to mention a cabin, into the middle of nowhere? I will tell you the story. Now my friend Ben Powell decided to find a place to get away from it all. It was early September of 83. Ben and his sidekick, Michael Wilhelm, climbed into their van, a Volkswagen microbus. They headed north across the Chesapeake. Fifteen hours later, they were clearing Canadian customs. They proceeded around Montreal and crossed over the St. Lawrence Seaway and on into Quebec City. From there, they headed east along the North Shore, on past Forestville and the Saginaw River, to the town of Bayacomo. After conferring with the locals and stocking up provisions, 
The two headed north on the road towards Labrador. Some 240 miles later, they reached Manic 5, the hydroelectric dam that contained the Manicougan Reservoir. The month that followed found the pair fishing, hunting, or otherwise exploring the expanse of wilderness in the surrounding area. Some 214 million years ago, a giant meteor had slammed into the earth here and created the huge depression which would later become the reservoir. The remnants of a hurricane heading up the Atlantic coast wrecked havoc with their camp one night. Snow piled up outside of the tent. Then awakened the next morning to find that a herd of caribou migrating through had very considerately stampeded around both sides of the tent instead of through it. The ferocity of the wind had drowned out the sound of the caribou's thundering hooves. Ben was hooked. In this land is where he wanted to build his getaway. For the next two years, Ben studied over topo maps and finally decided on the spot on which he would build his cabin. Not far from the Utishka River and surrounded by a gently rolling terrain with numerous streams, ponds, and marshes was Lake 866. Now gaining the right to fulfill his dream will become no small feat. While in Bayacomo, Ben had become friends with a real estate agent named Tony Nazier. For Ben, meeting Tony was a stroke of luck. As it so happened, Tony had grown up with a fellow in Bayacomo whose name was Brian Mulrooney, the Prime Minister of Canada. Tony prepared all of the papers, and with a little help from his buddy Brian, secured for Ben a 99-year lease on his lake and the land around. This would give him the right to build his dream. The most wonderful part of all, it was 85 miles by route of the Crow from the nearest road, and accessible only by air. In September of 1985, Ben and Michael returned to Bayacomo. Arrangements were made with Labrador Air to fly in the first three of what would ultimately become 15 otter loads of building materials from which the cabin would be constructed. Ben was about to actually see his lake for the very first time. The first plane set down. Canoes, gear, tools, and building materials were unloaded and placed on the shore. Now having never actually been there before, Ben and Michael decided to launch one of the boats and explore the area. Upon having the opportunity to see his new world firsthand, Ben realized that the preferred cabin site was on the opposite shore from where, by now, three otter loads of materials were setting. Two of the canoes were lashed together, thus creating a ferry to the far shore. The quaint little cabin would have all of the comforts, hot and cold running water from the pristine lake, a shower and a toilet that flushed. A propane gas range would provide modern convenience in the kitchen and heat for the cabin as well. A state-of-the-art laundry would provide Ben and his guests with a clean wardrobe, an important consideration should there be a Saturday evening visit from a native Indian princess. There was also a propane refrigerator and a network of gas lights. A gas lamppost would serve as a beacon at night for anyone arriving home late from a day of hunting or fishing. And of course, the kitchen sink. In just a couple of weeks, basic construction on the cabin was complete and it was declared home sweet home. For the next 12 years, Ben would tell me of his adventures in the wilds of Quebec, hunting for moose and caribou, blazing new trails, catching lake trout, Quebec reds and brookies, 
while feasting on wild blueberry pancakes for breakfast, fresh trout fillets for lunch, and roasted ptarmigans and spruce grouse for dinner. It hasn't been until now that I, along with Dr. Stan Porter, would join Ben and travel to his wilderness sanctuary after coming through some difficult years with my business in Virginia Beach. It seemed the perfect time to get away from it all. Three days later, do you know where we are? That's the question. Ain't it great? Ben, I gotta tell you, buddy, this is my kind of place. Doc, you got a load there, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> where, where are the sky caps when you need them? Well, Ben, Ben, you're home again. Well, I tell you, I gotta get home more often. <laughs> really? Did you unlock? No, I haven't been up there yet. I'll come up. I got the key. While Dr. Stan unpacked, I prepared some venison loin steaks and a fresh squash medley. Ben made the grill ready with an alder charcoal fire. There's a little appetizer tray for you guys. Thank you. Thank you, oh great chef. Smoked yeah, oysters. Oh, I like and those uh, droppings from that. <laughs> <laughs> smoked oysters, a little uh, smoked trout oh. salad. Ben, I know you're not big on smoked oysters, so the smoked no, trout salad's I'm for you. pass on They look like porcupine droppings. <laughs> anyway. The good part of being camp chef is missing the dishwashing chores. While Dr. Stan and Ben tidied up the kitchen, I enjoyed an apricot brandy in the tranquility of the evening in Ben's front yard. Early the following morning, Ben gave Dr. Stan and I an educational tour around his lake. We would need to know the channels. An unwelcome introduction of the outboard's lower unit to a submerged rock would be disastrous in a land void of repair shops. What a beautiful morning, sunny and bright. The slight breeze had fallen out completely. A mirror lake reflected the divine artistry of a painted blue sky with puffy white clouds. What do you got there, Doc? Who knows? <laughs> oh, look at that. Look at that. Hey, there's the baby. Oh, baby. That's about like the one I caught yesterday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> First fish. fish of the day. It's a fish. There you go. <laughs> Never met a fish I didn't like. What's on the end of your line, Bill? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more than I had. <laughs> Which isn't saying much. There he is. Look at him. A monster. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stan, you got a little better one this trip, don't I you, buddy? So. El Monstero. All right. Here he comes. Here he comes. Look at that right sucker. Get him. Right in the sucker. Look at that rascal. Don't lose him. Give him plenty of drag. That's the one we've been looking for all morning. That's right. Damn. You got a bow in the rod there, don't you? <laughs> nice lake trout. <laughs> you want me to net him for you? I think that'd be easier. Lead him right over here. Stanley. Well, Stanley. <laughs> Mr. B oh, my Lord, look at that hook. Just barely guys. there, huh? Hold that rascal up when you get him out. That's uh, that's a nice fish, but uh, it's not Mr. Big. It's it's uh, I tell you, when they get that size, they give you a nice fight, don't they? I'm gonna take a still shot of you with him before you release him. Okay. Well, but that's ahead. beautiful, beautiful fish. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. While I was landing my fish, <laughs> my native guide. <laughs> you know, you gotta do everything into, around here. Hooked into this thing. Are you a nice fish? I might need a net hand just so I don't break my uh break Got it? 
I don't want to lose my little yeah. plate here. No, you don't. There he is. All right. And morning. No, indeed. So far here. You bet. Ben's Lake, where there's no fish. We're approaching the southern corner of Ben's Lake. Here, a scenic little whitewater creek drains the lake as it winds its way to Truck Lagoon. We'll secure the canoe to the bank and trek overland for nearly a mile to the lagoon. Try a little different tactic. See if you can tie a bear-proof knot. It will be a while before we come back to the boat, I expect. Well, taking the trail up here to the other lake where this creek dumps into that's off to our left. <laughs> Dr. Porter blazing this jungle in the uh, in the wilderness here. Where's your machete? You're supposed to be swinging a machete. <laughs> I can barely breathe. Uh, all right. Well, we got. It's just a little ways. <laughs> well, this is where the creek that flows out of Ben's Lake takes an intermission. Flows into Truck Lagoon in here. I brought Dr. Stan here to see if he could catch his first fish of the trip on a fly. I've advised him to pick a fly that looks like a frog. You got him? You got him, don't you? Watch it be a lake trout. Yeah, that's uh... I don't believe that's the fish I caught the other day. Dr. Stan continued to dry his luck with his fly rod. After a couple of more fish, it seemed evident that the only thing Truck Lagoon was going to yield today was more lake trout. Maybe. So we headed back to the boat. Have you seen him yet? No. But he's pulling harder yeah. before he gets to the boat than the other ones did at the boat. So. Settle down, settle down, settle down. You're trying to that wrap it up, lose them tactic. <laughs> Good gosh. A little like trout. Now, I, you know, I really thought he was going to be a decent fish. That fooled me. Well, if you'd, <laughs> if you'd lost him, you'd have thought it was a 15-pounder. Really? Yeah. <laughs> the albatross fell off my neck back there. <laughs> Finally got one on this ultralight. At them at the back, they look like a cobia. Cobia. Yeah. And, uh, all right, come on. This time you're coming to Papa. One more turn around this way. Heads up, heads up, heads up. Not bad fish, really. No. <coughs> Wham. He is. About five pounds, four ounces. Good. You got a fish, buddy. <laughs> that, keep him away from that motor. That is great. Look at that. God, I hope we get to see this one. That's a big trout. Look at that. Jeez. You want to boga grip him? Yeah, I think we need to boga grip him. <laughs> need to shoot him first. Pretty work. Just, we got all day. That'd be a nice way to end a, the morning's trip. That's the first one I've seen the rod doubled over on. Oh my God! <laughs> All right, just just ease him this way. Give him give him light drag. Light drag. Jeez, I think I do. Jesus! <laughs> All right. Pretty work. Tennis elbow. I couldn't even lift Woo. him. <laughs> lift him up there, Doc. We oh, did good. <laughs> I don't know that I can. <laughs> now, when they get that size, they uh, put up a little fight, don't they? A little boga grip action. Isn't that pretty? Now, that's a nice lake trout. He weighs nine pounds. A nine pound trout. Now, before you turn him loose, I want to definitely get a still shot. Okay. Doc, congratulations. I believe you got. Uh, yeah, stand up. You got the fish of the trip there. Hold him a little higher a minute. Just that's a pretty trout now. He's 
bleeding. Pretty as you want, up here on Ben's Lake. He's bleeding. I'm going to let him go. Well, Dr. Stan and I decided to set off and find Ben. Of course, we couldn't resist the chance to pick up a few more fish along the way. Touch and release. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, well, there's another one of those rascals. Right, snag the bottom. A little light trout. Then Ben, you catch somebody? Well, I had a few chores waiting back at the cabin. And since we've been releasing all of the fish we caught, I sent Dr. Stan and Ben to catch us dinner. There was no arm twisting required. good for dinner. Got a little steamed cabbage to go with him, some basmati rice and some vegetables, some cherry tomatoes and green peppers and Vidalia onions. What do you reckon? About an hour that sucker will be done? I guess if the charcoal doesn't burn out. Yeah, we got plenty of wood we can cut for it. Alder. Smoke it with alder like they do salmon on the west. Stan, you had a couple rough days, haven't you? Yeah, and I'm sitting here and Quarter after eight, and I haven't been fed yet. You're usually in bed, what, 15 minutes ago? You bet. You mean you haven't been fed yet? I'm starving. All you've done all day long is eat. <laughs> I'm starving. You had uh, red, redneck pasta bazool for lunch. That's right. You just ate uh, smoked trout dip. <laughs> I offered you some chicken rice soup. That's true. All true. <laughs> oh, what we got here? A little uh, pan baked pineapple upside down cake. Ben made that in. Uh, we didn't have maraschino cherry, so we spooned what strawberry preserves in the rings of each one of those pineapples. And uh, I tell you, he's the only man I ever saw put two boxes of brown sugar in one pineapple upside down cake. So <laughs> it'd probably be sweet enough. Well, Ben, today we ought to try uh, over the lake. What is it? The creek to the left of the one we went up this morning? Yeah, it's a pretty place back there. What do you, is there a name that you guys have for that particular lake? Or? No, we never gave that lake a name. It's behind Bear Point if you go across land. Behind Bear Point, huh? Right, straight over by Split Rock up the cove. All right. Well, that's one route, and the other route is to take that canal to the left. That's what you were talking about doing. Yeah, the, well, I guess we're going to take the canal to the left because that's the prettiest walkthrough, right? Oh, it's beautiful back through there. Uh, Doc Stan, give it a try. <laughs> okay. Got his combat got, fatigues on. He's ready to you go. You got your walking stick? <laughs> He's got it. All right. 
we have kind of a gloomy looking morning over the lake. Maybe the rain will hold off. But you know what they say about a bad day of fishing and a good day at work. We're going to wind through this little switchback creek. It goes up through this marsh to where the brookies live. We'll go a little ways farther, then we'll have to portage. I think this is the end of the navigable waterway. We're going to have to portage from here. Well, there's the first little brook trout. He's pretty. Put him up here in the grass. Get a look at the colors on him. Got those iridescent blue and red spots. Kind of a red belly. It's a pretty little fish right there. My first one for Canada. And this little creek winds back in through the swamp here. And on up in here we find a nice little surprise. A nesting mother goose. Boy, she's looking right at me. Red there, I think, then, Ben. Save him, shot, and cook him, or is he big enough? Well, he's not real big. The brook trout I caught yesterday, those blue spots were real bright blue with those little red dots in them, like that. Hold him, let's see you can see that reddish belly, Bill. Get the red light? Yeah. Pretty little fish, isn't he? Yeah, he is. I believe he's a brook trout. Oh, there he goes. Oh, damn, you let him go. <laughs> Dr. Stan caught a ride back to the cabin with Ben for some necessary camp chores. I told them that I would be along directly, but right now I had a more pressing matter at hand. With that little task done, I headed back to camp for another pressing matter that awaited me there. Life's tough up here in the wilderness. <laughs> Takes two to wash one. Carving out your existence, having to catch what you eat, having to eat what you catch. Oh, shit. Uh, I think that one's got to go back through the rinse cycle. Well, I'm glad that was Bill's song. Yeah, he did. Yeah, it was my sock. Uh, what up, was What up, was fine. You boys are doing a fine job. When you get through there, I'll iron. What do you think, Doc? That looks good to me. A I'm gonna... rib for supper tonight. Hardly wait to eat it. <laughs> and over here we got a pot of uh, chicken soup on the stove. Here we have some ptarmigans smoking slowly over an alder wood fire. These are going to be great sliced up for sandwiches. Last year, Ben was notified by the Canadian government that new maps were being drawn of this part of the province. Instead of the identifying number, 866, as his lake had always been known, the mapping authorities wanted Ben to choose a name. This was being done for those remote lakes where cabins had been constructed. In choosing a name, Ben wished it to refer to some unique characteristic feature or landmark. He had always been intrigued by this peculiar boulder resting in the shallows on the western shoreline. Ben named his lake Split Rock. Ben left out at four this morning. I don't know if he's been fishing or water skiing. Let's get a report. Biting? Yeah. Good. Well, I'm going to get ready and go down that, uh, that southern creek. Down to the far end? Yeah, down the far end there. Well, we're approaching the falls here where Split Rock Lake empties out. Follows this little creek on down Truck Lagoon. Find a place to tie the boat up here and see if we can catch us a little brook trout. I worked my way downstream. 
finding hungry wild brook trout all along the way. These colorful little denizens were a great matchup for my three weight fly rod. I pulled one after another out of the deep pool at the north end of Truck Lagoon. At the bottom of every little fall, the brookies were stacked up. Such a vibrantly colored little fish. Bailing these wild Canadian spectacles of color was reminiscent of my charter captain days bailing Mahi Mahi in the clear Gulf Stream waters off the Atlantic coast of Virginia and North Carolina. Such graceful little swimmers. I even managed a good sized lake trout that was hanging out in one of the larger pools with my ultralight. These feisty little rascals ounce for ounce, pound for pound, to give any blue marlin a run for his money. There must have been hundreds of these brookies in this stream. What an awesomely wonderful afternoon, fly fishing these pristine wilderness waters. This day definitely calls for celebration. We'll just have to pop the cork on one of Dr. Stan's $35 bottles of wine. Well, Stan, Ben said uh, don't buy a corkscrew because he had hundreds of them at the cabin, right? Drywall screws. <laughs> now show us that technique, <laughs> will you? <laughs> oh, jeez. Screw the drywall screw into the cork. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ben. Want to see you come out here and, uh, and do the other side of this? Then you... Seems like me, I'll be an awful screwy way to uncork a go. bottle easy, of wine. Easy, easy. Oh, this is the best of all. Look at that. Ben, you've done a so magnificent. Here it comes. Perfecto. <laughs> now, <laughs> like pulling too. Sniff the cork. Make sure the cork's all right. <laughs> Excellent. I don't know. Well, we're going to have to suffer through and just get by with a uh, roast leg of lamb tonight. A little uh, sauteed mushrooms in the pan there. And let's see. We've got a little squash medley here. Something's missing twice baked potatoes. I came off and forgot the mint leaves so we've mixed up a concoction of uh, orange marmalade and apricot brandy for a dipping sauce for the lamb. Well I think the meat's relaxed enough. Dr. Stan will you do the honors and carve the lamb? With the drone overhead from the approaching beaver we are reminded for the first time since our arrival of a world beyond this wilderness maze of streams and lakes. The sobering recall of what they say about all good things sweeps across my mind. What an exciting, relaxing, and as Dr. Stan would say, restorative time has been here in Ben's Northern Reserve. What a diverse microcosm of society has been set into dynamics here. Dr. Stan, the Princeton University and Johns Hopkins Medical School graduate, me, the redneck from Pungo, Virginia, and Ben, the pioneer of yesteryear, alive and well. We all three have been bonded together unbreakable by the magic of this place. How wonderful to be the only boat venturing out upon the entire lake for a day of fishing. I am spoiled now, somehow fishing as I have known it before in a more inhabited place will have lost some of its allure. At the risk of appearing selfish, 
the serenity of being the sole angler on the stream performs soothing wonder for one's soul. How thrilling the surprise of an occasional fish, much larger than the others, contorting the ultralight rod into a doubled over position. Where does all of this endlessly moving water go? It's hard to imagine that its energy transforms into the bright lights of northeast big city skylines. It's so amazing that the effects of time somehow seem to elude this place. I wonder how many years before me, Split Rock came to rest on this western shoreline. How long after I am gone will it remain? If we truly are the first humans to have fished these waters, have the vibrant colors of these radiant little brook trout gone unnoticed? And, if not for the joy of man to behold, then who? Some years ago, while on a hunting trip to the Colorado Rockies, my dad observed Ben sharing a carrot with an old mare that had seemed to be abandoned and left living under a bridge. Guys like Ben are the salt of the earth, Dad remarked. Yes, Dad, I would agree. Who else would have sought out this secluded place? Who else would have exhausted the incredible energy so as to have such comfortable shelter from which to enjoy its marvel? Who else would have even had the brain power to bring it all together? We have fished until our hearts content. We have dined as well as any of the rich and famous. I may not look as grand, but I feel like Cinderella at five minutes to twelve. As the de Havilland beaver ascends from the surface of the lake, carrying us back to civilization, there is a mystical transformation that makes it almost seem as if we were never here. Ben will tell you of returns where it almost seemed as if he had never left. He doesn't get to come home to Split Rock very often. Somehow, just knowing that it's here is enough for Ben. Well, Ben, old boy, for the times you can't get home to Split Rock Lake, Maybe you can break out this video, pop it into your VCR, hit the play button, and Split Rock Lake can come home to you.